welcome everybody to Fitch Global Boss Capital Partner event today, educational event which talks about the basic theme is seven steps from innovation to funding. And uh, before we get into the agenda and details of the event, we usually have sponsor presentations. Today we are not having formal sponsor presentations, but I still want to acknowledge some of the sponsors of of this event. The main sponsor is US government agencies, NorCal SBDC Tech Futures Group, and they have been huge supporter of the Northern California ecosystem. And uh, we have been a satellite of their organization for seven years now. We work very closely together. So huge thank you for the powers to be there for blessing our event. Can you give Scott Wogalski just to say hello? Scott, just open your mic and say hello to us. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Axel, and thank you, KC, for putting this great event on. Uh, yeah, sorry about joining last minute, but um, yeah, we're uh, we're blessed to be partnered up with uh, Pitch Global, Axel, and, and uh, KC, so thank you. And uh, that's great. You know, sometimes, Innovation is also a lucky accident. And today Scott showing up and introducing himself is a lucky accident, which we've already got out of for this event. So Scott, thanks for being there. And uh, where where opportunity preparation meets luck is where the magic of innovation happens. So on that note, we uh, Pitch Global is backed by others like Trinet and others too. And we just acknowledge everybody in our ecosystem for for being a backer of uh, Pitch Global. And uh, today, uh, I by the way, I am Asaf uh, Chaudhuri. You can call me Casey. I'm founder and entrepreneur in residence of Pitch Global. Our company is Pitch Globally Inc. and brand is Pitch Global. And this event is co-led by my fellow entrepreneur in residence, Axel Tillman, who you've seen here. And uh, also, we pitch global we are we are into investor events and entrepreneurial education and before we introduce our uh, main speaker and presenter we want to share a couple of minutes of what is entrepreneurial education now entrepreneurial education could is like the a education means it is usually the opposite of normal rules of education, which means most entrepreneurs pick this uh, education up in bits and pieces through experience. Some go through a formal methodology, but often it is taught by, uh, by people who have not really sold companies or been entrepreneurs. So the thing is, we want innovators to aim for the stars, but before they get on the rocket ship, there, the engine has to be working. They have to be some, some gap in their entrepreneurial awareness and education, which needs to be fulfilled. And the highest form of entrepreneurial education is from educators who has created amazing success again and again and again. And today we have, this event is co-hosted by Boss Capital Partners, which has exited 14 companies. Their co-founder, was part of $2 billion sale of Magento to Adobe. And uh, with this kind of knowledge, information and insight is just unavailable anywhere else. So we are very fortunate to co-host this event with them and uh, to particularly have Randall Loveview of Boss Capital Partners and co-creator of Boss Methodology to, to bless us with this presence. So, Today's event is uh, step one uh, of seven steps for from innovation to funding. And in order to do that, one needs to fill the gap in entrepreneurial education, which Randall will teach you how you can do the right thing and not do the wrong thing. So on that note, I hand over the floor to you, Randall. Please give your background a little bit more and also share how Boss Capital Partner Works, and uh, talk a bit about Greg Shepard and other people there, yeah, and, uh, and then get on to the main act. 
Thank All you. right. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Axel. Thank you to the whole Pitch Global team. Um, to all the founders, entrepreneurs here, um, I know your time is valuable. Uh, we're going to make this brief. I, I promise this will be informative. Um, and then at the end, there's an offer, right? A free offer for courses that we'll get into, uh, which is around this whole process that I'm about to talk about. So the reason uh, I'm here today uh, is I work at a company called Boss Capital Partners. Um, it's an investment syndicate. Um, and on top of that, I also co-founded a company called Boss Startup Science. And the way those two things are aligned is they bring together the methodology that we use within our portfolios um, and which led us to even creating an investment syndicate in the first place. Um, and we're here to teach you that process today and why it's so informative, especially at the stage that a lot of the founders are at today. So prior to Boss Capital Partners and Boss Startup Science, um, I had spent 15 years uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, starting companies, uh, working as a consultant to help companies start up. Um, I was part of a very large transaction that won uh, four private equity awards, um, whereby I was the CMO that helped divest uh, Magento Commerce from eBay Enterprise. Uh, and then three years later, uh, due to our growth, we sold for 1.8 billion. Um, I leveraged that to start a consulting firm um, and then eventually transitioned into an investor. Um, so my specialty is growth um, and around growth, which is informative to these uh, uh, people on the call and the founders, um, is the fact that I'm able to tie exit strategies. Join right, the meeting. Which is the, the primary goal for founders to build your company successfully into a strategic exit. Um, and tie that to a go-to-market strategy. So through these practices and principles, um, we leverage the boss methodology to transform companies. And I'll walk you through that here in a second. But first, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the investment side uh, of Boss Capital Partners. Um, so as Casey mentioned, uh, we've had 14 successful exits. Uh, that's out of 15 investments. Uh, the 15th investment is still active and it's on a two to three year trajectory uh, for an exit. Um, our special sauce, our differentiator uh, is the boss methodology. And what we've done is we've taken that methodology uh, and codified it, turned it into a curriculum that could teach you the processes that an entrepreneur needs at every stage of an entrepreneur's journey through the maturity um, and also added practicum in there. So while you are learning and educating yourself, you are also using your own data and information to build your company. Um, and this is the foundation for any great startup. And, and we'll walk through how we got to that process here. So we're gonna keep this brief. Like I said, uh, I'm gonna be cut off in about 15 minutes here. So I'm gonna try to get through all these points, but it's important to know that this is the first of many. Um, so what I'm gonna be laying out here is the foundation. Uh, this deck and presentation is going to be shared after. So although I'm going, going to be going through this quickly, um, you are going to be offered a free course or free entry to a curriculum uh, at the end of this through Pitch Global. And there are in-depth videos that cover everything that I'm touching at a high level here. Uh, so I'll encourage you to go and log in uh, after this presentation. So before I jump into the curriculum, um, how to use it, uh, it's important to know why we created it. Um, myself, Gregory Shepard, who I encourage you to look up, um, has been a, a very successful investor, entrepreneur, has won several awards, um, and uh, he has spent his life collecting people, one of which is myself and some of our other partners um, who specialize in particular areas of a business. Um, we all have come from modest backgrounds um, and uh, have bootstrapped ourselves essentially and learned the hard way um, how to build a business. Uh, it's through that process and us putting our uh, perspective um, specialties together uh, that we were able to create something truly unique and really solve a problem uh, that founders and entrepreneurs create, are, are facing today. So to touch on this uh, slide at a high level, 4% uh, of people living in poverty are able to overcome financial hardship. 98% of those who do, do it by one of three ways. So either through an inheritance, 
the lottery, which is crazy, um, or starting their own business, right? So 75% of those that do make it out start a business, um, but people who um, have the personality uh, and have the um, uh, ability to start a business typically face um, some neurodivergent problems, right? And uh, this makes it difficult uh, to codify a process and make it um, uh, available to everyone and something that everyone could leverage, right? But we approached it from a different perspective. We realized that no matter who you are and where you come from, 90% of startups fail. So money really isn't the solution. Um, resources may not even be the solution. Uh, there is a particular education level missing um, in the ability to start a company. Um, so we did some research, right? And if you do research and have done research over the last 10 years, which by the way, that 90% failure rate for startups has existed for over the last 10 years, which is crazy considering all the technology innovation that we've gone through in that time. And yet that number remains the same. Um, what happens, and this isn't going to be a surprise to anyone, is people are literally playing a numbers game. So if the 90% failure rate exists on the entrepreneurial side, that means that 10% of investments are working, right? So one out of every 10 investments that an investor makes is going to get a positive return or going to be considered successful. Uh, therefore, investors are requiring companies um, to uh, unnaturally shoot for higher valuations. So if they do exit that company, that one exit could forgive the sins of the past nine mistakes that they've made or bad investments, right? So the, the, the two sides are working against each other. Um, if you look at the reasons and why this is happening, right? The number one that you're gonna see is that they ran out of cash. And then there's gonna be a mix of, of just about everything you see here. Um, Again, these reasons have been consistent over the last 10 years, yet they're not solving the problem. So we, we consider these lagging indicators. There, there's a level deeper that you need to go. Um, because of time, I'm not gonna go through the specifics of the research, but the output of it is essentially from our side. Um, and we spent five years researching over 2000 companies, um, hundreds of interviews. Um, we came up with five specific reasons. Uh, management team dysfunction, failure to understand customers. Um, and this is an important term that we're going to be talking about a lot, uh, which is ideal customer profile or ICP. Um, an incomplete exit strategy. Uh, again, this is one of the differentiators of boss. Um, most cases, uh, entrepreneurs and founders or startups do not begin their process by developing an exit strategy. Um, we talk to and, and disagree with many other investors uh, who say there's no time to do that. Um, grow first. And once you hit a certain growth, right, a, a mysterious number, um, it is then time to start planning for your exit. Um, we believe that this is completely backwards. Um, and again, uh, as I was talking before the recording started, um, we use a tool called the North Star uh, to kick off every company. Uh, whether it's from an investment perspective or we're starting that company ourselves, the North Star is a tool that we use to help set the direction of the company uh, or a roadmap. And um, think of it as a GPS. The, the two most important um, components of a GPS is where you are right now um, and then where you want to go. You, you enter those two components, you will get a route to your destination. Um, think of the North Star in a similar fashion, which includes a complete exit strategy. Not having these things typically leads to overvaluation, right? Um, and again, this goes back to the 10% of investments work, 90% of startups fail. Um, the, the numbers game has caused um, unnatural things to happen in the market and force entrepreneurs to go on a unicorn trajectory while they may not be a unicorn. Right. Um, and again, a $50 million exit, $100 million exit is not a bad thing. Not every company is, is set out to be a billion, a billion dollar company. In fact, less than a percentage um, of any companies that start out will ever become unicorn status. Now, um, because 
uh, companies don't operate themselves in a standardized fashion, having all of this information as a foundational aspect to, to plot and plan the trajectory or maturity of your company, they, when they seek advice, they're often getting bad advice. This does not mean that the people giving them advice are trying to hurt them or, or um, you know, they're doing it um, unbeknownst to themselves because they have no idea the context in which the company is concurrently, um, how to know what they've done in the past, what they should be doing in the future, right? All of this uh, is housed within BOSS. And so by using BOSS, you enable yourself when taking advice from people, which we absolutely encourage you to do, to give them the full context so that you don't chase uh, bad advice, essentially. Okay, so we took those, and how am I doing on time, Jill, just before I? Absolutely yeah. fine. Okay. Yeah, we are not in a hurry. You know, Randall, this okay. is, you know, very insightful. If you need to go over five, 10 minutes, you know, totally fine with that. Okay. So um, in order to create this curriculum, um, which is based off of a life cycle, which we're, we're leading into, um, we, we took the reasons that, that companies fail or startups fail, which I showed you before, there's the five. Um, and, and we had to balance this uh, or cross-reference it against something, right? Um, and what we chose to do is, is to look at the trajectory of a typical startup. And in that trajectory, um, from both an entrepreneur or, or founder's perspective and an investor's perspective, there are specific maturity milestones mm -hmm. that have to be met um, or validation points, right? Points of validation, and you'll hear this often, product market fit, um, customer validation, revenue validation. Um, these things are happening um, and investors are asking questions around these things, yet there wasn't a process to really get to these levels uh, um, of maturity or maturity markers. So we went through the life cycle and we said there, there are five that really stick out to us um, and that if met, typically help a company with the number one reason that they fail, which we saw on the, the slide before, which is running out of cash. Um, and running out of cash is due to a lot of different reasons, either mismanagement, um, receiving too much money and not knowing what to do with it, suspending it uh, recklessly. Um, so by following these maturity milestones, uh, we were able to create something truly unique. And so the, the milestones are, are these uh, two vision. Right. And so this is very early on in the process before you have built the company, you have a vision typically. And this vision needs to be validated by someone, of course, in the market, someone not only who is a subject matter expert in the market that sits at a high level and could say this business works um, for this market, but also a potential user, right? Um, businesses typically start uh, for a couple of reasons, um, to um, preserve something good, um, to improve uh, the way of life or, or something through automation or to right a, ter a terrible wrong. Um, so the, the typical foundation of it is I'm a person, I see a problem, I'm, I'm not happy with it. I come up with a solution. That solution could be leveraged by other people. And now I have a company, right? A basis for it. Um, but before I go take money, I need to make sure that this is something that has legs and can actually work, right? So I need to get two very import, important points of validation, uh, customer and subject matter expert or industry leader. Once I have that, I could feel comfortable taking money and I could raise the confidence of investors so that they could help me. Um, I could get to that next level of validation, which is two product, right? So I'm gonna take that vision idea. Typically you're gonna go to an accelerator. Um, the accelerator is going to help you uh, identify ways to get that cash. Um, you're going to use that cash to uh, create a product, and then you need to get that product validated. Well, who better to get the product validated than by the people who originally told you that your vision was a great idea. So what you start to see forming here um, is what we call a user advisory group. Um, this is a, a group that is close to you, um, that it represents outside market validation but in a, a very uh, easily accessible way. So they could help you get to these points, making sure that you don't hit that critical uh, reason of failure, which is uh, you know, running out of cash. 
once you create that product, now you need to get it to revenue. Well, if you've done a good job collecting um, thought leaders and people that could validate your ideas, product requirements to help build your, uh, your product, um, you then should be able to have them test that product uh, and use it, right? And, and either become a paying customer in terms of revenue or because they did you all of those favors, um, you know, you have a contract for future revenue, uh, but they're, they're using it now. This is an important point of validation. When I create something um, that someone said that they would use and would like, and I went and raised money for it and I give it to them, if they don't continue using it when I try to take it away, the red flags, you know, sirens should be going off. I may not have validation and that's a word of caution to move forward, right? So this revenue validation point was extremely important. Now, the next level after you have revenue, um, and th this could uh, waiver depend on, depending on the type of company you have and the type of exit that you're shooting for, uh, but is to break even, um, to become essentially independent of the need for investors. Um, when you could bring in as much money as you're spending or more and get to profitability, um, the, the chances to experience dilution as a founder uh, drastically go down um, and the opportunity to raise more money essentially goes up, right? Because now you have a formula for, I know if I put money in, I'm going to get X amount of dollars out. And that's an important term that we'll cover later, which is CAC to LTV, customer acquisition cost to lifetime value. This is a key metric to help you get to this point of maturity break even. And then finally, the next stage is to exit. Um, there's an important evolution that happens as you're developing your company, whereby you start out developing a product or service that could be leveraged by the market and bought by the masses, right? And, and, and high volume typically. Um, at a certain point, your company needs to transition to where your company, now all four functional areas, become the product that you are going to sell to an acquirer. Um, and the potential acquirer of your business will look at your company just like a product, right? They're gonna go through several levels of validation. The, the top three that they go through um, are culture, um, uh, technology and customers, right? So built into Boss, we have ways very early on before you get to that point, right? Beginning with end in mind and thinking very early about how to make sure that you could uh, achieve those points of validation, making the transaction easier, keeping the multiple up uh, and, the, and the valuations up. So what this has all led to is the life cycle model. Um, this life cycle model is a tool that we use, again, from an investor perspective um, and from an entrepreneur, founder, startup perspective. Um, we look at this life cycle as uh, leveling the playing field. Um, typically, uh, investors are asking you questions um, in order to identify where you sit on a life cycle similar to this, right? Um, and based on where you sit is how they evaluate the risk of your business, um, how much money they should give you, how much value your company is worth. So there, there's a lot of things that go into this. So knowing where you sit in this life cycle and not only that, but where you need to specifically go next in order to achieve the next milestone, which is either more growth or more money or um, you know whatever it may be, you'll use this life cycle. So again, built within this, are the five reasons or and more, uh, but the top five reasons that startups fail, uh, the maturity milestones to help you get through them. Um, and um, there is a curriculum built to help take you through this process. So when you uh, first enter the curriculum, um, so after I get done talking, uh, there's gonna be a screen that shows you the link and the login you are going to see what's called uh, the essentials of BOSS. Um, BOSS, by the way, I should have started with this, starts, or stands for Business Operating Support System. Um, so what this is going to do is by uh, leveraging this curriculum, uh, it is going to be a vehicle that's gonna help take you through this maturity life cycle, making sure, again, that you are very purposeful in building your company 
uh, that you're growing the right way uh, and that you have an ability to raise money at will because you're meeting the validation criteria that investors look for uh, and you could show that to them in a preemptive way. Um, there's some important things. And, and is it okay if I keep going, Casey? I, I want to be sensitive. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Randall. So um, looking at this life cycle, the first thing to note is, um, it, you know, it starts at vision. Uh, like I said, well, not every company is at vision level, right? There's maybe some people on this call right now that have a product already. Um, maybe he even have attempted to go to market um, or are in market right now. Um, that's okay. What this does um, is it balances, um, and again, there might be people who have taken uh, investor capital. It's okay, you could have a cap table and investors on it still leverage BOSS. We utilize BOSS from an investor perspective to help clean up companies, um, companies that have matured the wrong way. And how we do that is we try to understand, okay, where are they from a fundraising perspective? Um, you could look at this as, um, as pre-seed, seed, series seed, series A, series B, right? Um, and there's all sorts of terms. We don't put them in there because it, it, uh, it, it creates a lot of debate trying to identify what those rounds are. But rounds one through five, typically. Um, it, it's important that um, you align yourself to where you are in your fundraising round and where you are in the maturity that you've created through efficiencies within your company. And if you are ahead of your maturity by fundraising, there are ways that you could leverage boss through essentials in order to catch yourself back up. Um, so again, it, it, you don't have to be from the ground level uh, here. When you're creating um, your essentials um, curriculum or when you're going through it, you're gonna notice that there's a process of the curriculum. First, you're gonna to be told uh, what and why it is what you're learning uh, that's in there, right? There's 11 foundational elements to build your business. Um, you're gonna learn that through video uh, and through written uh, word. Uh, there's also audio, right? So there's three different options uh, for you to learn that. The learning leads into what we call practicum which is a series of questions uh, that you're going to answer and processes um, where you're gonna input your company's information uh, into the system. By entering your information into the system and, and, and going through the, the 11 courses and processes, you're gonna end up with a pitch deck. Um, these are the elements essentially of a pitch deck um, that you can then take to investors to articulate your vision to articulate your points of validation, where you are in your maturity life cycle, where you're going next, and of course, all the, the traditional elements of a pitch deck. Um, so there's extreme value in going through the courses. Um, other than that, I'm gonna be covering the specifics of uh, this life cycle uh, in future uh, webinars. Uh, so I encourage you to come back uh, because tucked within here, there is a lot of detail um, you're kind of seeing the picture. There's a lot of what, why, and how uh, that we'll go through uh, that, that could help you in your journey. And Great. So Axel will, you know, look at uh, if there are questions, but I have one question, Mando. Mm -hmm. Part of what we are doing at Pitch Global is letting entrepreneurs get into the mindset of attracting corporates and CVCs from earlier on, both in terms of, you know, funding and partnership. And I am amazed to see many CVCs are investing in seed round now. We just hosted event with TDK Ventures and Goodyear, and both said they invest in seed round. So your experience of taking company, spinning out company from eBay and selling it to Adobe for a couple of billion, I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. Can you also give a couple of tips to entrepreneurs, how they can start thinking about corporates as future partners? Yeah, so um, it, going back to the, the life cycle, um, one of, I, I mentioned the top three points of validation that an acquirer goes through, and it's culture, technology, um, and customers. Um, the, the customer piece is very important. What you're gonna be doing in Essentials is identifying your customers through an ICP 
and going through your ideal acquirer profile, right? Which these are, are the potential people that you're shooting for, for an acquisition. Um, and you're also going to be identifying their customers. And the reason that you're doing this is through customer attachment rate. Um, that is one of the quickest ways and easiest points of validation for a strategic uh, exit is for the acquirer to be servicing the same customers that you are, right? So they're uh, focusing on share of wallet by you offering a new and improved or a different solution, you open up and in, improve their share of wallet within their customer base. So they, they want to see that validated. Casey, to your point, um, from a, a, a CVC perspective, um, one of the leading um, indicators to acquisitions is partnerships. Um, and traditionally, you've seen these large corporates um, have very strict partnership models um, where requirements to become a partner, the levels of partners that they had were very high. Um, and these were a certain type of company, right? Typically over $10, $15 million in revenue. What you're seeing as a leading indicator to show that CVCs are opening themselves up to companies earlier downstream is their partnerships are tied to companies that are much, um, uh, much earlier on their maturity curve. Um, and they're doing this to get access to potential solutions that they are either are considering building or don't want to build and want to support uh, through the partnership and potential investment or acceptance into their program um, and, and fulfill that need for their customers. Um, so keep that in mind. And, and again, this is, is within the curriculum um, that partnerships is, is a great way to increase your validation. And you're seeing um, more corporates be more open um, to uh, partnering with smaller and, and earlier stage companies. That's great. By the way, I just saw on LinkedIn uh, that Someone I'm, I'm connected with in Pepsi Ventures, they invested $15 million in an early stage fund. So it, maybe they, they don't want to invest early stage, but they are going through funds in which they're investing, through mm -hmm. whom they can kind of get early adopters of startups. So would, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Axel. I would like to actually assert and highlight one important element of your entire presentation. And that is the expectation on valuation of young entrepreneurs or even older entrepreneurs. We see so often that people come in on the vision, uh, maybe product stage, 40 million pre-money. I give you a classic example um, of why that is actually wrong. There is a company, I don't mention the name, up in Menlo Park. They raised in the beginning of 20. 20 at 40 X in sales, 40 X in sales, $60 million at a valuation of $1.5 billion pre money. I was part of a company called Arcsight that sold for $1.5 billion at $318 million in sales, five X of sales. So that eight times higher valuation will break this company's neck on any follow-on round. They either will not get capital or there is such a dramatic down round because they've completely lost sight of the end game. Yeah? You cannot be proud of that valuation. You, can actually, you actually need to be sad about the valuation that you got at that time. And Randall, don't you agree? 100%. I mean, it, there's investor expectations, right? So... Um, if I take uh, $40 million, um, I know that investors are expecting at least a three to five X return right now. <clears throat> so I have to ask myself, is that $40 million going to equate to over $120 million in revenue? Um, if it's not, I should, I'm going to put myself in, in, a, in a situation where I'm potentially going to have to have a down round um, and I'm going to eat the dilution as a founder for that. Um, it, you need to be very cautious. And, and that's a, it's a great point, Axel. Go, going through this process, um, here, I'll tell you a story about how we used Boss uh, for one of our portfolios. Um, so there's a, a company called Delarock um, that was in the transportation services uh, arena. Um, uh, they, they built these card readers uh, to go on, on buses and public transportation. Um, 
they uh, were fumbling and overbuilding essentially the product for about five years. Once they started applying the boss process, the first step was to look at the market and the ecosystem and the potential acquirers. And when you look at that, you start to understand the, the um, valuation drivers and requirements for acquisition, right? What do they look at and what's important to them in terms of how they measure your company and how much money they're going to pay for it? Um, what we realized is that it was not a multiplier based on um, revenue growth or based on customer acquisition growth, a number of customers. It was a strategic fit. They had the customer base. They could take care of margin. Um, they could take care of growth. What they really cared about is that there was a new market segment that they wanted to break into, and they wanted five to 10 customers from that market segment and for them to retain for over a year. What that required us to do is not raise excessive amounts of money and try to take this new server or solution and put it in every bus and public transportation around the world, right? All growth is not good growth. We, we took just enough to get the product to MVP, put it in the hands of five customers who later transitioned to revenue paying customers because they appreciated helping us through the process of getting it right and using it for free for a while. Um, and what that led to is 1.5 million in, in top line revenue. And um, in two and a half years, a, uh, uh, an exit for over 45 million. So a 40 X multiplier, right? For building the company the right way and not taking on excessive amounts of cash, building it according to the North Star, the life cycle, and what your strategic opportunity is as a founder, startup, and company. There is a question from the um, participants, and the question is, why is revenue before going to market? And um, I tried to answer this, but uh, let's um, hear your answer. So um, th this is uh, part of the process, and, and within BOSS, uh, there's a term called ABLE, the, uh, the Alpha Beta Launch Experience. I mentioned that validation points from outside the company are very important, right? So it, it, when you go through the boss life cycle, in vision validation, you take a group of people, users and industry experts and get them to validate that your idea is good. That's the premise for ra raising money. You use that money um, to build a product. You go back to those people once you've raised that money and say, you said this is a good idea. Um, you said you'd, you would use it. What are the requirements? Now rubber's hitting the road. Specifically, what should I build here? How should it look, right? They're, they're the premise for your requirements. Once you've built that, you take that to them and you go through an alpha beta uh, experience, right? Where they're now commenting on, on the requirements. You're, it's starting to come to life and become real for them. At the end of that process, there's a very important validation point. If you built something of value that can work in the market, those people who have tested it, given you the idea um, or requirements from your idea, uh, helped you test it, they should wanna continue using it, right? If they are not willing to continue using it, um, whether it's for revenue right now or future revenue, right, based on, on the favor, um, you should not move forward. So what you're doing in the revenue stage is you're validating that I can earn money from a particular type of ICP, a particular type of customer. Thinking back to, to the acquisition thing that I mentioned, right? The three levels or uh, requirements for acquisition. One of those three is customers. So proving very early on, before I start raising a lot of money, go out to the market um, and, 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 and you know, make a big splash, I need to prove that this type of customer I can bring in and I then prepare myself to bring it in at scale. The other reason is because when you go to market, this timeline is important from a timing perspective. And if you'll notice the entire life cycle is three to five years. When you have a vision and product, you're, you're kind of, you're very low key. You're behind the scenes. The market really doesn't know about you other than the investor community typically. When you start to push that product out and you go to market, you, a, a big flare has gone up, right? And any um, differentiation you have now is up for grabs where another company with more resources, right? Typically your competitors um, now understands that idea, that value proposition. And it typically takes them between two to three years to build a competing solution to yours. So going to market 
in the sense of I am launching my website, I'm pushing outbound messaging, I'm, I'm advertising, I'm making people aware that I'm here is very dangerous, right? And you want to make sure that you can validate, you can bring in revenue before that. Now, at the end uh, here at, um, from optimization, right, it's very important to start thinking, when is the right time based on the market conditions to start shopping the company, right? Because you have to leave upside. And that goes back into raising too much money and getting yourself into a situation where it takes too long for you to reach the investor expectations. And that example of raising 40 million, having it have to be worth 120 million, if it's gonna take you three years to do that and several more rounds, you're just digging yourself a hole. Right. Plus additional risk factors, right? Life can throw you curveballs. So you think you can do $120 million but then something changes in the market and all of a sudden you cannot reach it. And so the bird in the hand may have been better than the two in the bush. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, we don't have, you know, a, a pandemic, a global pandemic listed in here, right? But that could happen, right? And we've seen that. So market shifts, market crashes, consolidation of the market, and then just external factors like a pandemic. I mean, that could derail you the entire time. So having yourself on a life cycle to know, right? For instance, a lot of our companies during the boss process, in fact, all of them survived the pandemic, um, but they were able to understand how long of, uh, uh, how big and how long the pivot should take in order to get back to some sense of normalcy, right? And because they were adopting the boss principles, having, um, you know, a, a liquidity buffer because um, boss covers everything from the tactical execution of your marketing to the financial aspect of your KPIs, valuation drivers, cap table, uh, you name it. So um, yeah, there, the, the one point I guess I'll get to there is that in a crisis, there's no silver bullet. Um, planning and preparation prior to the crisis, documentation, standardization, um, understanding how your business works, right? That that will save you in a crisis. And to your point, why is the revenue prior to going to market? I was part of a startup company and our initial customer, which was security, network security, was driving the product. But when we wanted to standardize sales in the outside, we had to learn that the security guys could not make a single decision. It was a networking folks. So after you learn by going out in your first real sales attempts, you need to shift the entire marketing strategy and sales strategy over to a different sales channel, to a different messaging, because the security guys were only secondary in the decision process. That's a, that's a great point. And that's a, another great example of why holding off on going to market right? And you're going to, to mark, you're sending your solution out, but to a canned audience, right? It, it's protecting yourself. Um, and the important thing is as market conditions shift, right? If you're in a bull or bear market, um, people are concerned about different things, right? Making or saving money. Um, so typically um, a single product holds two narratives. Um, for instance, um, an automation solution could be in a make money situation. Um, you could add uh, more people and they could be doing more, right? Um, in a save money situation, you could reduce headcount and make your people more efficient. So in, in controlling the narrative, understanding how the market conditions play into that and where you fit in the life cycle, you know, allows you to test these options and make sure you're planning for the, the right type of market. Absolutely correct. Casey, are we going now over to our um, um, one minute pitches? Yes, uh, yeah. so let's do that. Randall, once again, thank you for amazingly insightful presentation. It's just the start. This will have six more once a month so that the seven steps from innovation and funding, you know, takes place. And uh, we have uh, the Boss Capital Partners, BSS methodology to to give the life, to plug the holes needed to have a holistic uh, entrepreneurial education. You know, considering all, not just now, not just being in survival mode, but also having, developing foresight so that the right business outcome is achieved. So before we start the one minute uh, presenting. Can, can I make a procedural suggestion? Every entrepreneur that wants to do the one minute pitch, turn on your video camera, 
And once you're done with your portion, turn it off. This way I can keep track whom I have to call or not to call. Well, that's great. And uh, also, maybe we can start with Scott, because today, you know, there was no formal presentation from NorCal SBDC Tech Futures Group. So if he's there, why doesn't he give us, of course, he's not limited to one minute, but he, Scott, uh, can give us some, you know, uh, the vision and the mission of how U.S. government agencies are empowering the entrepreneurial ecosystem. All right, okay. cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Casey. Appreciate it. I'm on sure. my phone here. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, Tech Futures Group, um, we are, we're federally funded by SBA, Small Business Administration, and they're also funded by the state of California. <clears throat> and because of this funding, we come to entrepreneurs like yourself at no cost. And um, Casey and Axel are one of our affiliate partners, as they mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so you're able to take care, uh, uh, take advantage of their services or one-on-one -on -one advising services to help you start, scale, get access to awesome partners like Boss Capital and other um, <clears throat> access to um, resources and VCs and angels. And um, so we, we offer these events, these no-cost webinars that Casey is doing here today with Pitch Global. And then we also offer um, no-cost SBIR and STTR grant servicing to help you uh, get that uh, grant financing that you need to start or grow. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we specialize in all techs, um, all different tech, deep tech, AI, bio, med, health, uh, education tech. Um, so yeah, we're here for you at no cost in Northern California. Thank you. That's great. And Scott, you had invited us, Axel and I, to some event hosted by UCI Deal, you know, about a few months ago, which we took part in. And one of the presenters talked about how they were grouped by Boss Capital Methodology. And uh, their boss's uh, CEO, founder, Greg Shepard, is in is San Diego. So as uh, offline events are opening up, especially in LA, they have opened up. So maybe we'll do something with SBDC, SoCal, and Boss Capital Partners and all. Just, just a yeah. thought that always you know that's the rule of sales always be pitching right <laughs> you know and so on that note that's awesome thank you for sharing that's cool You're welcome and uh, and thanks scott and to reiterate your point you know we had a couple of comp uh, clients one client telemetrac he applied to he just closed this round 800k but he applied to sbtr grant on his own money and it was turned down then I introduced him to Chuck, and he got a starter grant to find other grants. He got like 70, 80K, and now he said publicly that he has been verbally offered a 15 times more grants with U.S. Wow. government Air Force because they are disrupting the cargo theft business using kinetic energy. And, you know, entrepreneurs, the founders went, you know, from Harvard Business School when worked in Bain and McKinsey, very top shelf. So they are, we are making a, uh, Edgar is guiding me to write a, you know, story, but whatever it is called, you know, we've never made one. Edgar has been after me for ages to create a story which gets into your website, but we are starting yeah. the, the trap. It's called a success story. So that's cool. Great. Great. Thank you. Oh, yeah. All right. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Thanks for, you know, uh, and uh, Randall meets Scott, Scott meet Randall. And uh, all, now I will introduce Axel, formally introduce him as my fellow entrepreneur in residence in Pitch Global. And uh, he and I, we are, and he in his past life was, worked in Sandal Road. He was US CEO of uh, Overseas Fund of Funds. And uh, he's big supporter. And he's also involved with uh, celebrity events. Sometimes he becomes acting CEO of other companies raising funds. Once he was CEO of City Summit Celebrity Network, and uh, he is it inspired him so much that he moved to LA, and uh, he is very dialed in in Silicon Valley and LA ecosystem. So he and I now we are going to curate the the elevator pitches, and we may make comments, and we may ask few of them to talk more. Once again. This part of the program is innovation by letting everyone present. 
give up elevator pitch, it cannot be perfect, then it's not innovation. So pardon us in case, you know, uh, some of it doesn't turn out the way you expect it. But once again, we are, this is innovation, we are trying this, and we want to, you know, in, improvise and keep making this part better and better. So on that note, Axel, why don't you start picking the companies and uh, let let them give a one minute elevator pitch. I would recommend they very quickly say who the, who he is, what they are looking for. If whatever makes you stand out, like you have already raised some capital, say that. Whatever, if you have already have some customers, say that. Or even your your company is brand new, but if you have if you had an exit or in your previous company, say you were VP in IBM, say that. Whatever raises your status and gets your attention right away. That's what Elevator Pitch is all about. And on that note, Axel, why don't you take the lead on this? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Casey. It's always a pleasure um, to be with you. It's always a pleasure to be in the entrepreneurship game. I recently call myself the entrepreneur's entrepreneur because Boss Capital and what we are doing, we have the same goals. We want success of our entrepreneurs at the end of the game. Now, my dear entrepreneurs, I only have one that turned his camera on. Does this mean that nobody else wants to give it a shot today? Uh, more cameras are coming on. Daniel, you will probably turn your camera on, on, but the one who had his camera on first is Carl. Carl Mulligan, and so you are on, on stage first. Please give us your one-minute pitch. Okay. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we do. Okay. Hi, I'm Carl Mulligan, founder of Supercritical Power Solutions. I'm working on an engine technology to help develop, to help in the global effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I do this by re-engineering the internal combustion engine to run on carbon dioxide, using no fuel and producing zero emissions. With a background in polymer chemistry and a lifelong car enthusiast, I thrive on developing creative solutions to technical problems, and I'm thrilled to have received the U.S. patent for my invention. This technology could be applied to convert most gasoline or diesel engines in a variety of vehicles, including cars, trucks, marine vessels, and even construction equipment enabling engine manufacturers to meet strict emissions regulations while retaining the current infrastructure, supply chains, and workforce. The opportunities are massive. The global diesel market alone is nearly $250 billion. I'm looking for a global partner with sufficient resources to help develop and exploit this technology. Great. Um, so there are many different attempts on going this route, um, how do you position yourself, let's say, against um, hydroca hydrocarbon-driven um, um, vehicles or electric vehicles? How do you see um, your playing out there? Um, I'm looking at the larger engine markets initially, um, more expensive engines, uh, things that would fit in maybe super yachts between one megawatt and two megawatts in the like 12 or 1300 horsepower to 2600 horsepower initially um i think it would be cost effective to apply the technology to a lower priced engine to start um using high pressure uh, diesel common rail technology which is pretty common these days and uh those engines are more plentiful. And I think that uh, compared to the battery electric conversions, um, it's going to be quite a long time before battery electrics are going to be applied to large engines. Do you have a co-founder or are you looking for a co-founder? Or... Um, I am looking for all the help I can get. This is, uh, I'm working in my garage. I've got a couple of prototypes that I've got mostly done. I have some technical issues that is going to take some money to overcome. Um, I've been doing this all on my own. I invented it. I paid for all the patent protection. I currently have a patent cooperation treaty application in that expires in April of next year. So if I don't uh, 
If I don't find some way of securing the IP to preclude others from using this technology, then I only have the US. And I'm looking for, I think, you know, there's, it's a really big market and I think the applications are, are uh, plentiful. And I'm looking for someone who can recognize that over the next 20 years, electric engine conversions or electric motor conversions aren't going to necessarily be the, uh, the ultimate goal or the ultimate solution for larger engines. So okay. I offer you, I offer you right to um, Axel at pitchglobal.com. I'm more than happy to uh, spend some time with you um, to go over in detail what you are so that I can try to connect certain dots and certain people to you. Randall, you, would you like to make a comment? Yep. Um, and by the way, I'm um, taking notes on these and um, based on the, the curriculum, I'm uh, going to recommend specific courses and everything. Um, uh, but Carl, uh, what I, I would recommend um, wh when you have a minute with investors, um, it, you should leave about 30 seconds uh, for your story, which you did a great job telling. Um, but you need to be very specific um, on, on the ask. And to set up the ask, you need to um, articulate who you are selling to, what problem they have today that you're solving, um, how big a, is the market, and how much do you think you can capture with the investment amount that you're asking, which leads to what are the terms of the investment? How much do you need? What would you use it for? Um, all should be included, in my opinion. It sounds like a do one minute. That's, that's five minutes. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, it's tough. It's, thank it's you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you can turn off your camera so that I know that I had you. The next one up is uh, Neil. Neil Asur. Hey, can you guys hear me? Thank you, Axel, and thank you, uh, team. So I'm here representing Lee Bama. We are a... Uh, we're developing a radically improved lithium ion battery. I'm here with Wentao Lee as well, who's one of the co-founders of the company. So just for some context here, uh, lithium batteries are the centerpiece of the biggest energy transformation of the past 150 years. Uh, we believe a better battery is gonna drive accelerated electrification of vehicles and homes, uh, even potentially air and space flight. So what's stopping us from getting there? It's, it's actually the anode of the current lithium ion battery. Anode innovation is critical to unlock a better battery. Today's graphite-based anodes are the same as those that were used 20 years ago. So what have we done? We've reinvented the anode for lithium batteries. Uh, Libama has developed an advanced metal anode that enables a battery that has twice the energy density of current lithium ion batteries, which means basically you can go twice as far in an electric vehicle, for example. It's less than 15 minutes to charge the battery and it's 30% lower cost. More, moreover, this, uh, this anode can be stacked with any other battery architecture. So some of you might know about solid state technologies. This is compatible with solid state batteries and it doesn't have any uh, temperature or pressure requirements, which means it's not just gonna be useful for EVs. It can be used in drones or consumer devices. Finally, uh, this battery can, commercial, it can be commercialized quickly via existing manufacturing tech facilities. Uh, so, so far we developed a coin cell prototype of the battery and we've been awarded uh, SBR, SBIR, STCR grant from both the DOD and the NSF. We've also established a commercial partnership with a, the largest specialty battery manufacturer in the, in the United States. Uh, and what we're looking for now is to, uh, to expand our, our technology to a pouch cell prototype, which is that, that can be used in an actual drone or an EV. Uh, and to do so, I think we need $1.5 million, which will go primarily towards uh, research and development. And I think once we get there, uh, comparably to, to other companies in the space, this would be a potentially a billion dollar opportunity. Uh, just one last thing, the team that I have around me. So I am, uh, like I said, I, I'm working with Wentao Lee. Wentao has been, he founded this company and developed technology. He's been working this space for 15 years. We have uh, three advisors who are all CEOs of companies that are, that are billion dollar plus companies in the energy manufacturing space. I myself am a Warren graduate student and uh, have also worked in McKinsey. So we're excited about the path forward and, and would love to get advice and any perspective on uh, how we can accelerate that. And how much have you raised so far? 
So we actually haven't raised anything so far. We've, we've, we've bootstrapped it and we've gotten SBNR, SBIR and STTR grants from uh, the DOD and S S NSF that have told to about $250,000. That is, uh, however, capital raise in my, yeah. in my opinion. Not, yeah. Non-dilutive, but yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. non-dilutive capital raise, That's, which, is a, which is one element in the validation chain, um, as I would like to call it. Now, let me ask you one critical question. Um, the, crit the critics of electrovehicle and electromarket say that the cost of destruction of the batteries, the cost of production of the batteries equal um, out the um, energy advantages during their lifetime and have no carbon neutral impact at the end of the day. Can you tell, talk to, about this a little bit? Yes, well, I mean, I think we're very early in the stage of maturity in terms of how we're going to advance the, the, the battery. And I think what you're seeing is actually there's an ecosystem being built around the lithium-ion battery that's going to manage it from every stage of the life cycle, Axel. So yeah. while you're right, today there doesn't exist a, a lot of great technologies to make the lithium-ion battery more effective, and there aren't a lot of great technologies to help with the recycling of lithium-ion batteries to make them more effective. Uh, you are seeing a lot of companies that are raising like, extreme amounts of money in the space to actually advance that technology. I think that, we, that that is because there is a huge bet that this is the future of us being able to, to create a sustainable, uh, a sustainable sort of like way of transporting, uh, storing energy, right? And so I think like uh, ho our bet is that in the future, you'll see a lot of like companies focus more on this and that, that technology will mature and you'll start to see this become uh, much more palatable, right, than it is today. Okay. Yeah, Randall. I have an addition. Sorry. Yes, please. Question. So the 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 carbon neutrality for the electric vehicle uh, is actually uh, depend on the composition of the power power grid. So currently, the renewable power source is only a small part of the power grid. So with a gradual increase of the power grid by the renewable energy, uh, the turning point will be much uh, easier, and uh, it will the whole life uh, greenhouse. Uh, gas emission will be much reduced by the electric vehicle. Great. Randall, um, your turn. Yeah, awesome. A really cool um, opportunity. And I, it, I've seen a lot of uh, activity in this space. So you're in a, a hot market, which is really cool. Um, my question, I guess, would be is you're going to use uh, 1.5 million for R&D. Um, what's the objective output of that? Will you have a, a prototype um, and uh, will you be able to sell that prototype? And if not, how many rounds money um, do you suspect before you, you're on that trajectory? So, so 1.5 will uh, enable to have, uh, actually uh, have, product, have uh, like a goal for uh, different money. So for 1.5, we'll be able to fully develop the prototype uh, battery and then we'll be ready. I mean, once the prototype is developed, then uh, we'll be ready re to raise the next round for pilot production, yeah, it, which, it, it, which will be in the 20 million uh, side around. And, and just something, just one thing to add to that, Randall. Thanks for that question, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right now, we do have a prototype. It's in a coin cell, which is like something that you can use basically on like your watch, for example, right? Uh, but I think the real the real market here is actually for what's called pouch cells, which apply to larger uh, battery powered devices like vehicles. Right now, I think what you there are some other individual companies in the space, right, that have raised a lot of money based on just having that pouch cell prototype because of the potential of their technology. For us, we feel that when we get to that pouch cell technology, right, and prove that it can be it can be valuable to a drone or to an electric vehicle. Then we we're on the stage to where it's the next step is how do we commercialize that and how do we start manufacturing that? Uh, so I think getting to that stage is what that 1.5 million is meant to do. Thereafter, we raise another round to help develop a, a manufacturing facility to go directly to customers. Got it. I have one feedback for this. I was on the board of directors of a semiconductor company. Yeah. And um, the market was on the verge going from 32-bit processors to 64-bit processors. Their value proposition was four times the power at um, four times the output at the same power level or a quarter of the power for the same um, eff right. efficacy. Or yeah. They missed the boat to bring the 32-bit processor to the market and finding phone manufacturers that were willing to advertise a four times longer lasting phone 
<laughs> and they were shooting because the market was in conversion to 64 bit. They said, we need to go to the 64 bit market. Yeah. If there is a market for your coin sale, I would definitely use every brain, boss capital, anybody else that you can find, whether you can't make a revenue stream already out of your coin sale. If there is a value proposition good enough to, to make that happen, because if you're shooting the next level up, or you say on the next level, oh, I need to make a car battery, you may end up raising $120, $400 million and you don't go anywhere. That's only my little advice of my experience. But Randall is shake is not in his- 100%, yeah. And that's where I was gonna say, and not to take up too much time, but what, what those kind of questions lead to and where investors get nervous around investments for R&D um, and, and development is that it's gonna be on a path to, to never being done, right? And, and especially when you're an engineer founder, uh, which is a great thing, and there, there's extreme value in that, the investors are looking at that, that my fear is they're gonna be building forever and they're never gonna be satisfied and we're never gonna have a product, right? So the term minimal viable product, when you're, you're talking about R&D uh, raises, uh, fundraising, you, you should articulate specifically, this is the MVP that I'm building towards and then we're going to validate that through customers and revenue before we move on to future roadmap development. Perfect. Yeah. This is great feedback. Thank you both. Uh, just one last point I would add is, is we do have a commercial partner with a large specialty battery manufacturer contingent upon us reaching the pouch cell, which is why we're aiming for that as well. But I think your, your points are really valid and we'll, uh, we'll definitely take them away. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. If you turn your cameras off, the next one up is actually um, big, dream big. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Just that it's vital for competitive, competitive startups to find investors. The same is true for nonprofits and obtaining grants. However, nonprofits, this is something that they have to do all year, every year for the life of the company. Like myself, everyone hates the process of spending months writing so drenching grants. It is overwhelming and time consuming. On top of that, it takes away from the work we are really passionate about, which is working with our communities and setting our goals. And paying for a grant writer, which costs anywhere from $3,000 to $7,000 for just a single proposal, is sometimes not possible or a solution. My name is Rene Diaz. I'm a founder and CEO of Grant Aid. Grant is an automated grant writing assistance that makes grant writing easier and cheaper. It's easy and stress-free to do in minutes and at least 30 times lower in cost than hiring a grant writer. We include a grant database that also speeds up the process of finding grants. Our target market is minority-owned nonprofits in the urban areas that are education and community focused. Our grant database is already it's going to release in a week. We have a working prototype of the AI grant writing app. I'm in the future tech group and the MIT except we're in two of um, Randall, minute. Would, would you like to say something? Um, I was having a, a little trouble hearing uh, the whole the whole pitch. Um, but uh, one thing I would say to the, the group is if you uh, you did a great job by putting your company name and your as a participant. So as a founder, any Zoom call that you join, you should have your name and your company for promotion, right? So that you, they could start tying the, the two together. Um, so I, I unfortunately, I couldn't hear the whole there's some static, but um, that, that would be a suggestion. I can give you the quick summary. So the grant writing process consists uh, basically out of two major problems. Number one, there are so many grants that you need to identify which grant could you potentially qualify for. And there is a few technology, one pitched actually at Pitch Global a few uh, months back that actually do this process pretty well by putting uh, key terms in their search engine and they come up with all the applicable grants. And the second problem is then to write a grant. And the writing of the grant uh, needs to qualify, make qualifications and proposals to the, um, to the grant 
to cater to the grant so that you ultimately get have a chance of getting the money. He says that he has AI that can auto-write the grant, um, which in itself will require a lot of in-depth discussion, which we don't have time today for, but that's the market he's in. So it, it, it eliminates the, the amount of time it takes to get the grant? And the grant writer. Know. There are specialized grant writers with different success rates. The best ones have about a 70% success rate, meaning if you hire them for $5,000, you can 70% guarantee that you get your whatever it is, $50,000, $150,000, $250,000 um, grant by the grant issuing authority. And he says you don't have to spend the $5,000 anymore. His um, AI technology will do this automatically for you. That's really um, that's really interesting. I'm interested in talking to you about uh, this offline. Um, yeah, I have a lot more questions. And I think there's applications to some of our portfolios. So I, I would be interested in... Uh I would love to join the call because I have a tons of questions. Um, I'm, I have studied a lot in the area of language recognition and language assembly. So whenever you set this up, make me part of it. Well, let me just ask really quick, who is the buyer of your services? Is it an individual entrepreneur, uh, founder? Right now, it's, right now, it's usually the founders um, who have a small team. They can't afford a grand writer on their team, or even if they do, that grant writer on their team is actually doing multiple jobs because it's just small money. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Very cool. I've got a ton of questions, but that's very yeah. interesting. What information would you like me to give you? My phone number? I can just send it to you in a private uh, Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, I think send my email phone address in there. And Randall, you know how to reach me. Email me with the um, appointment, and then we can jointly have a, spend some time with him. Very cool. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Turn your camera off. Our next one up is Q Jung or Q Yang. No, Jung, right? You are muted at this point in time. Q. Uh, Q Yang. Q Yang. Okay. Yeah. There you go. The yes. world is experiencing cybersecurity costs reaching an average of $190,000 per second. It's about six trillion dollar a year. What if a technology destroy any cyber threat at the CPU level, like preventing cancer at the cellular level? Let's imagine a world without cyber crime. I am Dr. Q Jung from the Microsys, and we believe we have a most effective way to protect your information from all cyber threat. Our technology secure your system proactively and inherently, unlike others reactive cybersecurity solution. We need a half million investment to bring our intellectual property and prototype to life and ultimately protect your system and information from every kind of cyber threat. Here's our promise. We will end this cyber pandemic without endless vaccination or worries about future variants. We will make a cybersecurity comprehensive, full fruit and accessible for all and we will no longer have to imagine a world without cybercrime. Thank you all. Thank you, Q. I could say a lot to this. I come from the mm -hmm. cybersecurity industry. Um, um, you had a very limited amount of time to present. We understand where you're coming from, but the questions are now, the devil is in the detail. Knowing, mm -hmm. yeah, knowing for example, I give you only one example, that AES-256 is still actually foolproof. You cannot break into the data. And the leakage of data is actually not by breaching into the communication streams, but by the stupidity of the people clicking on links and uh, unveiling their passwords. Once you have the keys to the kingdom, no cybersecurity measure will actually prevent <laughs> that the kingdom is being rolled over. So I would be very much uh, interested to learn how you will make a claim of a 100% secure uh, world. Okay, so uh, if you know about, you know, the basic of uh, computer, you know, the computer actually take the, you know, the uh, program uh, written by, you know, the people or machine, and then it's coming down, in, you know, the uh, computer, uh, there is a CPU. The CPU take the 
we call machine language and execute it, then if something happens. That's why I mentioned it. We take this cybersecurity at the CPU level. You know, current, current technology, why we call it reactive is they, this solution protect any threat come into the computer, right? Once this computer is coming, there is no way, simply say game over. But gatekeeper of your information now at the CPU level. So for instance, you know, uh, I'm bilingual. I from, you know, the, uh, uh, my mother tongue is South Korea. Okay, so if I say something not English, you may not understand, right? Same way, we we can make you know the uh, your computer using millions or millions you know the different machine language at any time. So yeah, I that's the, yeah. fully understand. I wrote that plan fifteen years ago. I can send okay. you my business plan from fifteen years ago where we took that approach. Um, unfortunately, no VC wanted to fund this because they said you cannot be in the computer business. Um, any longer because it's not no longer profitable uh, because we needed to fundamentally change the architecture of motherboards or phones in order to 100% accomplish what we thought. You may have found a new way, no, but no. I remember this case. Can I, you can like I, to can I, can I uh, yeah. Well, very eloquent vision statement, but in this, there are two things. One, you have to say, why you? You know, so you have to say share your background what makes you unique to to accomplish this and b if you have some traction of course then why you doesn't become so important that means right. you're further along so can you okay. brief, give an answer blending these two questions okay so uh before that you know let me let me answer to what uh, i asked okay our solution just to rep you can replace you know the current cpu that's all Right, and also uh, uh, it's our company. I I, I actually have a, you know heavily uh, uh, involved you know uh, government research through my uh, uh, PhD years, and also uh, uh, other other project in you know the startup, and also my own startup. We heavily I heavily have an experience about you know the uh, architecture level. Right. So uh, initially, this, you know, the company, we uh, focus on high performance and low power. Currently, you know, uh, about 60 percent of you know, the instruction, which is, you know, the uh, very low level uh, machine links come into CPU, but it is not never executed. It's discarded. We changed architecture level, right? So we're not we're not actually doing transistors or you know the other circuit. No, we changes this architecture. Okay, so that actually allow us to using you know the you know the millions of language. Current CPU only using one language. So like every CPU company, they will introduce about you know, the new, you know, the new set of instruction set every three, two or three years. So okay. we, we, we are, this is going, dragging us slightly. Yeah. Can you, do you have, how much have you raised so far? And briefly about your team. Okay. Uh, fortunately, we, 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 uh, we couldn't try, uh, we couldn't get any uh, funding yet. However, uh, the maturity of technology because of you know so several years of our development, we believe about uh, eighty percent done. So that's why we ask you know so half a million dollar investment to uh, uh, to produce the prototype. We just uh, try to contact like uh, more industry like you know Tesla or you know others. So you know future vehicle. You know, like a Tesla puts very you know strongly about you know autonomous, right? But now, you know, the autonomous car doesn't 
doesn't have a you know big issue about cybersecurity. However, definitely it's vulnerable. So in the okay. future, many autonomous cars running on, they you know the cybersecurity is going to be mainstream. So we 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 ask you know uh, Tesla contact you know uh, Intel. Hey, you guys make a CPU with this, and then we'll buy, and then Intel going to produce it, or I'm going to be produce those kind of. So we can- sell blueprint. Not in you know, a chip making uh, anything. Yeah, yeah. I, I can share with you a lot of my past history where right. I, I went down this route as well with a totally different uh, product company. I encourage you to contact me, um, sure. Axel at pitchglobal.com. And Randall, now your uh, comments to this. Um. I don't have a lot of uh, experience in this space, but um, I, I think the, uh, a theme and this will will help um, is going through the courses. But one of the outputs that you'll get is being able to quickly articulate who you are, what you're doing, who you're doing it for, and how you're going to get there, right? And that leads into how much money and, and being able to tell that story will become a, a lot easier. So definitely register for the courses. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Q. If you turn your camera off, please contact me. I have lots of experience in that field. Okay. And um, now we come to Paul, Paul Walski. Um, Paul, tell us your story. Nice to meet you. My name is Paul Wolski, and um, I have a PhD in biochemistry from UC Berkeley, and what I'm trying to do is use the immune system to attack and kill prostate cancer. And so you might have heard of immunotherapy, and immunotherapy basically allows the cancer to be visible to the immune system by blocking a target that tells it to leave it alone. Well, in my case, there is a different target on some other cells in the tumor microenvironment that's different than on the cancer itself. So this is a relatively, it's a, it's a offshoot of current immunotherapy. So what I'm trying to do is raise about $500,000 to get some initial validation based off some of the literature that was done from the uh, laboratory that I've been discussing with. Uh, I filed a patent for this on my own money and I've made it to the full patent state. Um, There's no, in my opinion, encumbering IP and I am partnering with a business person right now who is assisting me with some of the development and I'm looking for potentially you know, some advice for getting in contact with contract research organizations, um, develop, trying to may- maybe perhaps get a specific plan for the, the next level to get a value inflection. And so, yeah, it's a relatively early stage thing, but this is, this is what I'm working on right now. Thank you. Um, one thing I would like to say and simplify this for some of the audience, the belief system is that the immune system would eat actually up the cancer if it wouldn't be, so to speak, um, cloaking itself to be invisible to the immune system. I had a discussion with one of our ecosystem. We can introduce you to him, Dr. Chris Apfel. He is from the Carizza firm. He is their life science uh, specialist um, who has actually a cancer treatment research as well. He believes that, and he explained to me that this value proposition is very difficult. So he rather takes a cancer cell, throws many different toxins at it to see which one kills the cancer and then targets the particular cancer uh, with the death threat, so to speak. Now, one thing you need to take a look at, um, BioNTech has 13 plus years, $1 billion later and couldn't solve a single problem in the cancer research field with mRNA. So targeting M- with mRNA cancer cells to become visible to the um, immune system has failed them for basically 13 years. This is my only feedback I'm giving you on, on this. And I'm more than happy to make a connection with Chris Apfel for you. Thank you, Axel. Yes, actually, I was. I, I mean, mRNA, mRNA would be actually an easier and cheaper way for, for addressing this problem. Uh, and I it doesn't work. It. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't work. Yeah. Yes. One billion dollar, 13 plus years later. Nothing beyond clinical phase one. 
Randall, any um, information you would like to give? That was an awesome pitch. You, you did a really good job. And Thanks. I mean, I, it was engaging. It, it left just enough for me to want to know more, but yet you hit all the, the tips of the ways and were answering questions as they were coming up in my head. So it, it was great. Um, what I would consider is when you're going through the courses, um, there, there's a section called the ecosystem. Um, and before you take on something like this, it's important to understand aside from the solution itself, right? Which is very complicated and has a whole bunch of things, right? There's the, the business side of it. And, and um, um, yeah, there's uh, that I don't know if that's me, but yeah. And you have to decide or, or understand, are you building um, a, a, a IP that you're, you're going to sell, which won't require a lot of overhead? Are you building a, a series of patents? Are you building an entire company around it? Um, where do the gaps exist? Are people trying to solve this today? Could you make it easier for them? So things like that, just kind of getting your footing and what's around me, what's coming up and what should, you know, where could I potentially go with this? As an investor, those would be the type of questions. Like, am I getting into something that's shooting for a billion dollar IPO? Or is this something that we're going to build up quick and offload to someone or, you know, so, but again, those are natural questions. You did a great job. It's a great pitch. Thanks, Randall. Yeah, those are some interesting things that uh, I, I've, I've thought about. And uh, I think talking with some people who have more business experience would actually be very helpful for me on that, actually. Yeah, Paul, you are hitting also one of my uh, pet peeves in the area of my interest fields. I have several verticals in of, of interest. Um, I encourage you to contact me. Uh, I repeat, excel at pitchglobal.com, and we can engage into a discussion there. Yeah, we'll and one, one last thing, Paul, as Randall said, I second, you did a great job The starting. Uh, one other point you may want to prepare is proactively don't get uh, slotted as a lone wolf. That's the only thing. So if you can say, oh, my colleagues, my professor, even if you don't have a co-founder, if you don't have partners, I mean, just hint, you know, say that, hey, my dissertation, my professor is encouraging they are on my board even if you don't have start talking to people and creating your board and team it doesn't cost anything but it uh, that's one uh, perception you need to overcome and earlier you take the bull by the horn and and uh, and talk about it rather than someone trying to kind of put you on a spot it will and it will give your uh, mission jump started even more absolutely Great. correct Thank you all very much. I, I also, one other point for everyone too, is that, um, being honest about what you're looking for and you, you saying like, I'm looking for help in these areas, right? Like that's a big um, positive from an investor perspective that you, you know who you are, you know what you're good at. You're probably going to delegate the things that you're not. And the hero syndrome is something that investors are fearful of is that I'm going to invest into this person who's going to attempt to do everything, become overwhelmed, and I'm going to, you know, lose out on my investment. So, yeah, great job being honest and all that. Good job. Thanks very much, everyone. Looking forward to seeing you soon on the call. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with you very shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have no additional camera turned on. I will reach out Daniel. Daniel, you would like to give it a shot? No, we have no more entrepreneurs today that would like to get feedback, quick feedback and uh, from our expert at Boss Capital. You know, sometimes people like to be more prepared. Well, so and and if you want to do it in an individual setting, but I put my email in there, I, yeah. that's what we're here for is to help entrepreneurs. So there's no judgment. I help people all the time and, and they later come back for investment. So do not look at it like you have to hide your company, get the, the advice and, and, you know, the information now. And yeah. So. Yeah. And sometimes people, they get negative feedback in public. So they won't, don't want to talk about it. And some others think about IP issues as well. So that's, then those are also things we have seen. Hey, um, so actually, I think this part is there's, there's Nelson who just turned himself on. Yeah. Welcome, Nelson. How you doing? 
We are doing fine. So I guess, uh, I, I, why not, right? What the hell? So uh, whenever I'm ready, right? Yep. Okay, at Foil Flyer, we've created airfoiling, which is an alternative for skiing and snowboarding for as climate change makes uh, the uh, skiing snowboarding industry kind of obsolete. Since the turn of the century, 100 ski resorts have closed in America, no, 70, excuse me, America, 100 in Europe, 200 worldwide because of a lack of snow. So um, an airfoiling, not needing snow, will be an all-weather, all-season sport. We'll give you more adrenaline for less danger. My name is Nelson Heidchick, Chief Adrenaline Officer for Foil Flyer. What are you looking for? Money, partnerships? Right now, I need a proving grounds. And I've been battling with the city of San Francisco to let me use a crane on uh, an unused crane, but it's a, cradle, it's, a, it's a crazy bureaucracy, right? And it's, uh, you know, I don't know, understand why if I have insurance, you know, uh, engineering report, agreed upon fee, if you use something that hasn't been idle for like a decade, why not? But um, bureaucracy. I have a company that has bought in Colorado an old ski resort area that based on COVID, they have struggled um, how to keep it going, what to do with it. But maybe that is the pivotal in idea that you have and you can test on their private grounds because I think they own the property. Um, that could be a way for you um, to make your next step. Well, um, here, I'll leave. I'll send, uh, I guess, your numbers on the thing. I'll give you a call. Excel at pitchglobal.com. Pitchglobal.com. Excel at pitchglobal.com. Randall, you uh, turned your mic um, on. You would like yeah. to say something? Good good job, Nelson. And way to go. Like, just give it a shot. That's, you know, I, I love that attitude and everything. And it sounds like a, a really cool um, sport, right? Would you consider it a new sport? Oh, yeah. It's definitely, it's, yeah. um, well, just to tell you what it is, is anybody ever been on the zip line? They're fun. Mm -hmm. They're excited. Yeah, in Reno, we have seen it. Yeah. Reno downtown. Oh, he froze. You just got disconnected, Nelson. <laughs> Your well, internet. Please. This is recorded, so he, he could um, look at my, um, my comment to him is that um, while this isn't a, a typical in investment that uh, Boss Capital Partners would make and or not, nor a typical company I'd work on, um, our founder and CEO, Greg Shepard, who I'm sure everyone will have a chance to meet, and I suggest you, you look him up in his background. Um, he invests personally into um, new technology for hoverboards and um, extreme sports, uh, as well as he owned um, a bungee jumping company uh, too at one point. So he might be, um, and he's in that your area. He lived in uh, the Bay Area, Colorado, uh, San Diego. So uh, he may be able to help uh, Nelson um, with some of the bureaucratic stuff. Great. But sounds fun. I am interested personally, just learning about it. Casey, it, sound, it looks like you wanted to say something. No, I think uh, this, I think this part is over now. Yep. Giving everyone opportunity. Once again, this is, we are innovating, so it cannot be perfect, but, you know, we are getting a very good sense on how to take this to the next level next time. And Daniel uh, just came on. She has um, um, thought about it and she is coming on to tell us all about unlimited um, non-alcoholic cocktail um, for the use and everybody else, of course. Daniel, turn your mic on, please. You're muted. There we go. Sorry about that. I heard my name. I had to leave the room, but I came back in time. So I'm glad okay. that I'm here. I'm Danielle and I'm the founder of Unlimited, which is a social beverage and lifestyle brand. And so a little bit of background about me. I, you know, felt the social pressure to drink alcohol from a very young age, since I was 14. It has been a central element of my social life. And as I went into a university program that was very hard, I went to school, one of the top business schools in Canada for finance and operations. 
And during that time, I actually was in a relationship with someone who um, was an alcoholic. And at that time, just witnessing, you know, the level of destruction alcohol can cause in a person's life, it made me take a giant step back from it in my own life as well. But as I did that, I noticed just the social tension between a new and evolved lifestyle choice and our current social culture that does revolve around alcohol. And the more I noticed this, the more I noticed that uh, millennials and Gen Z, the next generation, we are inc incorporating more wellness and social wellness aspects into our lifestyle. And as we do that, we're shifting away from leaning into alcohol in our life. You know, we're getting away from that. But as we move away from this preference, we are met with this social tension between a new and evolved way of being uh, that is more wellness focused and our current uh, drinking culture. So we run into a, even more of a problem now that when you choose not to drink alcohol, you're met in those social moments with you know, your only options are water or a soda, and none of them are culturally relevant. And in order to shift a cultural perception, you have to integrate into the culture that already exists. And we see doing that through the beverage itself, the central force of all of those moments. So Unlimited is a ready-to-drink canned social beverage and lifestyle brand that is not altering your state in order to feel confident and connected to other people. So we don't add any mind altering or state altering ingredients, and we are not mimicking what the taste of an alcohol spirit or a beer or whatever that might be is. We are taking what a restaurant cocktail is, the layering of flavor with juice components, herbal components and spice elements with soda water to create elevated social positioned beverages that fit into those occasion moments. So you can feel a part of the moment while also feeling like you have something to champion instead of hide. So we've been building our team of uh, past Red Bull um, and other start beverage startup uh, marketing uh, employees. We actually just onboarded someone from White Claw who is a part of their founding team. And we have an advisory board of executives at Coca-Cola Emerging Markets and the Honest Company founder, Christopher Gavigan, who just IPO'd a billion dollar company um, in the CPG space. And so we are raising $500,000 to bring our product to market. We have tested our product with our early adopters, our advisors, and our early investors. A great sample group of um, our target market, which are millennial urban women. And now we are taking that validation to market direct to consumer and on and off premise in Los Angeles as we scale to uh, further regions. Randall. Really cool. Um, I'm not a big drinker, so I'm interested. Uh, there's a appeal to it. Um, I, I do have a, a lot of questions, um, you know, and uh, again, um, when I mentioned before, one of the, the top five reasons for companies fail is bad advice. It's hard to give advice right now, right? That's poignant without understanding the full context, right? So a lot of the questions I have would lead me to that. But things I, I would think about is um, like validation through um, your uh, go-to-market approach, which is likely, like you said, going to be marketing, social media, influencer-based. Um, so like being able to show the activity around there and, and the fact that you've built a, a base and proven or validated that you could monetize that same group or following, um, you know, are things I would think about. And then a whole bunch of questions about distribution, you know, all that kind of stuff, but super cool. Interesting. Okay. Uh, do you guys have social, like, are you on social media now? Could I look you up and so we do have a social media page. We're not posting until the new year as we get closer to our launch. Um, we've cool. been doing a lot of uh, behind the scenes community building. So yeah. with thought leaders, influencers, um, core uh, early adopters that we actually are doing sampling events with. 
and then seeding our product into uh, select accounts in Los Angeles. So on-premise accounts like Spring Place and Soho House and uh, different hotels. And so that's um, what we're going to be doing prior to our D2C launch. Cool. And the other thing is I would I would try to avoid, you know, like your goal is not always to raise it. Like you want to raise as little money as possible at the beginning to get to the point where you could know the path to profitability and then really start bringing the rounds on then because they're safer and you're diluting yourself less, um, saving more for your team, all that kind of stuff. So I would really focus on, um, like I said, building a, a customer base that I pr- could prove I could monetize before I take money on and like have an honest conversation with some of your new employees and these people that have extended reach that have worked for these other brands, like with what you have right now and with friends and family or or, or on credit or whatever means of of raising money, how big could you get? Um, And then what's the cutoff point? And like, what are the, the markers? So, you know, month to month, am I getting close to there or should I start panicking and do I need to rethink this about bringing money on sooner? And what does that mean to the team and founders and everything? Yeah, that, that's exactly what we've considered. Um, because in beverage, it's a large upfront capital cost just yeah. for inventory, for a D2C platform, um, for distribution support, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. We do need to bring on investment at this stage, post product, but pre um, like market. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's why we're raising at this stage, but we will be raising like a larger round once we do have that validation and we're able to, um, test, especially the Los Angeles market. That's why we're choosing this as our, as our, um, pilot market. Yeah. And then something else for founders, because it sounds like, you know, where you're going with it and you know how much, and that's great. Um, that then the next step happens and, you know, founders spend time working on the business, which is fundraising, you know, almost 50% of the time. And then it's like, shoot, I got to now do, I got to do something right with it. And then I also still have to report back and keep them happy and prepare myself for the next round because it's going to take months to to get it. So um, really starting to think about when I get this money, you know, do, do I, am I prepared from an infrastructure perspective to track every penny, know where it's going, understand what I'm expecting out of it and have my leading indicators, early measures to say the investment is not working in this particular area and pull it quickly. Um, You know, so this would require like an MVP approach or MVT in marketing, you know, minimal viable testing. So before you'd launch a campaign to a million people, you know, take a chunk of a thousand, slowly get it, massage it. And then, you know, so, you know what I'm talking about, but yeah, that's, that's how I'd look at it. Uh, Daniel, for your background, uh, Randall, for your background, um, I have recommended to Daniel, we found there is a $750,000 grant by the US government possible for um, combating um, addiction problems, alcohol and drugs. And this would be a shoe, in in my opinion, if the right people read the grant application, to get her $750,000 non-dilutive funding and fulfill her great mission. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I did speak with uh, Delia yesterday. So. Okay, great. Good to hear. That's great. Uh, and also one last comment. And now Mira also wants to say, talk about Maxwell Bio, uh, introduce them. In Danielle's presentation, you know, in, in when you are presenting, don't save the best for the last. You know, you need to, your strongest point is your team. You've got to say that earlier on. Otherwise, you know, we see presentations which talks too much on the ideas and many of them are in napkin stage. They are solo players, they're too early. So mm-hmm. that's the only thing. Your storytelling was phenomenal, world-class. And if you at that time say, my vision has been validated by getting top team on board, that's a killer combination. So once again, thank you. And thank you. now we are working, we love to get uh, mentors on our platform. And uh, we have someone who was a deal floor chair of Kiritsu Forum. She invested in many companies, including Chris Apple's company, Sage Medic. And she liked this company so much 
because they want to go public, Maxwell Bio, that she joined them as corporate development head. So Mira is also helping us host our event during JP Morgan. And uh, what's now happening that JP Morgan has totally got virtual. Offline has been canceled. And suddenly in the last two days, so many new investors are coming to us. I think people whose job was to go to JP Morgan, they cannot come anymore. They are coming to our event. To give one example, someone signed up from B Capital Partners, whose founder is Eduardo Severin, co-founder of Facebook. These are people who just signed up once JP Morgan uh, in-person event got canceled. So Mira, welcome. Can you briefly uh, introduce uh, Maxwell Bio and uh, how we are creating the Life Sciences Committee? Just speak about it for a couple of minutes. Sure, yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing, like, don't share a deck or anything. Just kind of That's speak right. now. Excellent. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity. Actually, I've been uh, very actively communicating with a whole stream of investors this morning as we're looking to close out our, our seed equity round. But let me tell you about Maxwell and the reason why I left my role as the vice president at Kretsu Forum during the deal screening and uh, have joined this company because I've seen a ton of deal flow, you know, hundreds if not thousands of companies, and very few have impressed me so much with their transformational capacity and potential, not only to impact humanity and wellness and the world, but also to provide uh, tremendous returns for investors as we look for uh, how big this platform that we're building can be. So what we do, we're essentially a company that's, uh, well, without, without kind of showing you visually, imagine your innate immune system. You're constantly being bombarded by pathogens, viral, bacterial, fungal uh, threats that are coming. Think of the pandemic that's upon us now with COVID, um, cancer threats. So your body is constantly fighting with your innate immune system. And we have something that, arm, that we're armed with called peptides. Actually, we have like 1,000 to 3,000 peptides in our system doing all sorts of things. There's one particular one. It's called a human and antimicrobial peptide, without getting into too much science, is one part of your immune system that fights pathogens, but it breaks down quickly. It's prone to enzyme degradation. Bacteria will shoot enzymes out it to break it down so it's weak. And pharmaceuticals companies have been trying to use peptides for therapeutics, but you'll see the number of therapeutics with that kind of foundation are, have been waning. They're, they're going down because they're realizing these clinical shortcomings, these weaknesses. So what Maxwell does is we've created a first-in-class breakthrough drug development platform that has biomimicry of those innate capabilities of your body, but it kind of like puts an Iron Man suit on it and makes them more potent, more stable. Uh, the, the safety results are incredible. So we're mimicking the best, most powerful parts of your innate immune system with that enhanced stability, potency, uh, and capability. And we're starting with this one particular uh, peptide out of the thousands that we could mimic because there's so much research, there's so much activity, over 250 published articles, peer-reviewed published articles in high-impact journals validating our science. NIAD, which is the National Institute of, of Allergy and Infectious Disease, tested our compounds, found them to be extremely potent against the SARS coronavirus. They retested them, came back and said, we have pan-coronavirus efficacy. Um, so it's, it's quite tremendous. We're just now got word literally yesterday about how that's moving forward to, to move, um, the compounds forward for, for more research and, and more development. Um, there's a doctor working at the Baylor college of medicine who works with immunocompromised patients that have fungal infections set in. They don't always die from cancer. They die from these opportunistic infections for decades. He's tested things and found no solution until our compounds. So the Maxwell platform kind of solves this problem of being able to literally destroy the pathogen. I'm not showing you a visual, but if you think of um, the SARS coronavirus, for instance, it, our compounds literally attack a, a particular characteristic of the membrane, breaks it open, and destroys the membrane completely. Gums it up, it can't replicate. They actually said it's, it's truly viricidal, fungicidal, bactericidal. So there's lots of capabilities, but what is that mean for, for us in the world? Well, pharmaceuticals companies are looking for robust drug candidates that are 
going to you know, make it through the, the drug development pathway, which is a very expensive pathway, but with more robust uh, candidates. And if you look at what we've got our hands on, uh, the capabilities are, are vast. So um, right now, the, the market for just mimicking this tacklis item peptide is a $371 billion market. Uh, there's tremendous opportunity. Our team is absolutely tremendous. We have the world-class business uh, capabilities with Joshua, our CEO, 19 years of CEO experience, a leading world-first companies, and our scientific team, powered by Annalise Barron, who's an NIH Pioneer Award winner. She's literally recognized by her absolutely world-class uh, achievements in the space. Uh, our chief scientific officer, who's a leading biomimetic uh, chemistry expert. Uh, so we've got the science and the patents, tremendous uh, patent portfolio that we own outright, plus we in license some strategically from NYU, which is where our CSO, our chief scientific officer is from. The licensing model, spin-out model, uh, revenue generation model of the company does not require us to wait until the full end of FDA approval. The model is to license and work. We are a, a kind of an R&D uh, company that will create candidates and the relationships we'll have will generate upfront milestone and ongoing uh, generation from a business model perspective. And we have our first pharmaceuticals deal already moving forward. The first stages of the execution are happening and it's not with a human health company. It's with an animal health livestock uh, company that is tackling an absolutely massive global uh, threat to pork populations, and they're actually approached Maxwell because we have something that attacks any envelope virus and destroys it. So we're actually right now working on that research to move analogs forward and, and get a solution out. So lots of opportunity. If you look at biotech platform companies, comparable IPO exits, just with um, you know, kind of preclinical phase one, uh, the comparables are showing kind of the uh, return on investment of, of about 25 times. And that's Great. just where, where it starts. <laughs> Mira, before Randall and Axel gives their comments, I have a quick question. You mm -hmm. raised $30 million in non-dilutive non funding from not yeah. only U.S. government, also yes. Australian other governments. Absolutely. So Japanese, you, U.S., Australian. $30 can million. You give, uh, share brief, very briefly the experience and what other entrepreneurs should aspire for? to get uh, to get to government funding? Yeah, actually, I think uh, one of the things that we did, which was really brilliant, if you think of software and software development kits, you have like a foundation that you let people develop upon it. That is what our company has done. I think we're almost the only company that has like a, a, a scientific development kit. So we send out our compounds that are highly patented and we have a kind of like an agency model. So we'll send our compounds, for instance, David Corey at the Baylor College of Medicine. So he's doing work with fungal infections and we send them this kit. He works with the compounds. He finds a solution. Any of the scientists work with our compounds, they'll get, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll process the patents for them. They'll get 10% ongoing like royalties or, or, you know, compensation from that. We own the patents, but we're sending the compounds out, the Australian government doing work with how to prevent infection on contact lenses, the Japanese government, how to work uh, with uh, hepatitis, which is also a precursor of liver cancer, which is very uh, a big issue in Asia. So we have scientists all over working on different um, indications that use our compounds, develop, we're the benefactors, they, they're the lions, they're the experts. So they get funding, they request the funding, we help them and support them with those grant applications. And all that funding goes to support Maxwell's compounds and research and new applications, but everybody wins. And I think it's that triple win, like formula that allows everyone to benefit. And we're freely like wanting others to develop. We're, we don't want to like keep it all closed in like many researchers do. We've shared it. And the, benefit, the benefits of that can be just multiplied. You are curating the ecosystem. Fantastic. Yes. You know, because it's, in, yeah. because it's in other market, you are in the platform business, not <laughs> in the individual uh, product business. Um, oh. yeah, you have an enabling platform where others in combination with the platform create the ultimate product. 
Absolutely. And they take it to market. They go through those steps. But we form the foundational precursors with our literally no one has done what we're doing with this kind of lifelike nanotechnology. And they they build from that. So it's and by the way, I have sent you a direct message. Pick it up <laughs> and uh, we can talk about this more. All right. And Randall, does he want to make a comment? Um, I mean, it sounds very interesting. I could see why you made the, the move. I mean, what a promising company. Congratulations on your round um, as of recent. Um, one of the things that just comes up in my head when you're talking about your, your process, um, and you, you may or may not already know this, is the um, like consolidating the markets. Um, and, and when you have a, a solution that competes in multiple markets and sense to like create that uh, platform view. Um, I, I, in my past, I've always underestimated the amount of resources that would need to go into educating the market, um, you know, on this different solution. I, I always made the mistake of saying, well, the individual markets are primed, but I, I didn't understand they weren't ready for the big overall message. And it just took more time than necessary. And I have some um, suggestions just based off what I've done. If you'd like to talk offline about that, I could help. Yeah, yeah. We're also looking to enlist one of the world's top PR firms because right now with with the we've been kind of staying under the radar with what we're doing, uh, but there's so much capability that we're looking to engage now with someone who can really share that messaging and get that sort of knowledge built up about what's possible with what we're doing because it could be. Uh, Up to Randall's point, I lost a company with no. their software platform business and I initially grew the company by creating an end product. And then we had the second stage of the product development. And there I switched completely over to become a platform company versus a product company. And I failed completely at this. So too early. And, our, and our customers told us day one, we will never utilize this tool um, because they were not believing that we can be better with our computer generated technology than with their human minds. And if I would have understood why I grew in the first place and created the product out of it directly to market, I would have not lost the company. Mm -hmm. Great. I think this was good. And Mira also just compared to how Axel is uh, running the logistics, why, how Sharon ran last week, because mm -hmm. both are very good, both has merits. Actually, your events, investor events are like how Axel is running. And yeah. then let us look at the pros and cons of both, how we are going to run a JP Morgan event. Great. So now uh, this is the end of this portion. We have two small portions left. Axel is going to post my slide where I'm going to share seven, seven hacks, seven mindset hacks for innovation and funding. You know, it can, I can speak about it all day, but I'm going to do the seven within 10 minutes. And then Axel will talk about his experience leading on our behalf, corporate innovation spin-off of large mm -hmm. Japanese companies and, uh, and the lessons from a mindset point of view, Silicon Valley versus other cultures. And then he will give the closing remarks and close it. So today we have seven... Is the slide yeah. visible? Because I cannot see this right now. I can see it. Okay, good. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. So first, I'm, go I'm going to, uh, the seven slide uh, points are on, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, say the first one, give few comments, move to the second one, third one, go to the end. And at the end, if people have any question, they can ask. Otherwise, I'll hand over the floor to Axel. I would encourage everybody at least take a photo of this. This may be one slide, but it has taken decades of experience to come up with this. And this is oversimplification at the highest. But once again, this is, we, this is series one. This is a new series we have started today, training series with Boss Capital Partners, which calls, which is said, from innovation to find funding. And the first one is mindset. So we are going to talk briefly about mindset, seven mindset hacks for innovation and funding. So the first, first one is fostering collaborative mindset, 
which is our values, our core value of Pitch Global. To give an example, we are mentoring two companies out of the many we are mentoring on behalf of U.S. government funded uh, programs in Northern California. And the founder of the two companies, Cargo Chief and Telemetra, both, even though they both attended Harvard Business, they met at our event. And uh, Cargo Chief became investor advisor to Telemetra because, you know, someone else could have thought of them as competition, but they felt they this is about how creating ecosystem. And now Telemetric got grants, and now Cargo Chief is getting help uh, how Telemetric got grant. So this is how, if you can become collaborative, that means develop collaborative mindset for others instead of looking at them as competition. Ultimately, you will develop collaborative mindset for within you, and it will give you create empathy for yourself, and you will look within, and you will be able to make your mindset, you know, more conducive to your success. So what is mindset? Point two, our experience shapes our beliefs. That means when we undergo a positive experience, we get a positive mindset. We undergo a many uh, negative experience, we get a negative mindset on that particular thing. Like, for instance, someone who's never had a car accident will be will have a certain set of mindset about driving on the freeway. But if, unfortunately, that person gets into a car accident, that person's mindset about driving on the freeway will make a change. It has to be. That's human nature. So basically, our experience shapes our beliefs and which shapes our mindset. So that's the second point. Then three is what is unique about Silicon Valley mindset? It is tolerance to failure, which means someone starts a company and fails in most part of the world that will give him a negative mindset. It has to or her a negative mindset because that's the nature of the mind. However, Silicon Valley ecosystem is very conducive to uh, treating a failure up to a certain point as a badge of honor and uh, tolerance for failure says, okay, you have learned, now next time you won't make the mistakes. So that is the Silicon Valley mindset, which goes against human nature, against normal grain of how we usually would get affected through our experience, negative experience. So basically, uh, you can have a positive outcome even from a negative experience, which in normal cases is not the case. And how to have an innovation mindset? This is also tied to the uh, following point, how to engage all three parts of the mind, reptilian, emotional, neocortex, which means most of the time, our mind, a big portion of our mind is reptilian brain. A small portion is neocortex that we generate thought and cognition. And in middle, we have the emotional brain. So the thing is, in order for you to be innovative, you cannot do more of the same or you cannot work even harder because you already work as an entrepreneur. You're already working very hard. So a couple of examples of how innovation took place. Take the example of the printing press. Gutenberg went wine tasting and saw wine presses and got the idea of printing press. So if Gutenberg just stayed at home or is in his home office and worked even harder, he wouldn't have had the breakthrough innovation. So in order to create, have an innovation mindset, you got to rest and relax and also expose yourself to domains from outside your normal reality because that's where from your context, the new ideas will come from. That's why people like Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, they all talk about the books they are reading because that's where, and especially these books would be from outside their syllabus or outside what they do. So how to engage all three parts of the mind? You know, this is a huge topic, but you can uh, read more on them. But the key is most of the time human beings are, yeah, 
uh, human beings are about uh, operating from survival mode. So you have to, as Mira says, connect the dots and and also create the context so that the dots would connect in a nonlinear way. So you got to play, keep the playing field so that you rest, relax, you know, uh, connect with friends and family. All these things are also dots in your world which can create innovation. So now we come to the last two points, how to understand the mindset of investors, especially CVCs for funding and partnerships. Uh, you, you got to understand that it's not one size fit all. You got to do the research, you got to have empathy and you got to understand how, what people are really looking for. And if you, if there are multiple, you know, general partners in a VC firm, or if they are, uh, it's a large corporation, like we hosted IBM Ventures uh, um, last month, and they talked about how the various ways by which people can connect within uh, within IBM. That's great. Even Boss Capital Partners is a huge fan of, of Stephen Covey. You know, they are, you know, Greg Shepard always talks about Stephen Covey. I love, you know, you know, begin with the end in mind and sharpen the saw. Wow. I also am a huge fan. So how to understand the mindset of investors is you got to first acknowledge that um, it's not one size fit all. You got to, and then just taking IBM's example, if, uh, you know, the normal perception may be IBM companies are too small. If you are at not at a certain stage, IBM may not be interested. However, there are areas like quantum computing where they are investing a lot. They are really seeking how to find the next big thing there. So if you are a quantum computing entrepreneur and even very small, you may not even consider IBM. But you know what? You got to do the research. You got to not break away from the limiting beliefs and see how you can make things happen even in a nonlinear way. And the last point is, I, which I always emphasize, how to shape the perception of investors. When you're presenting to strangers, they will judge you because human, the judgment is a nature of the mind. I mean, if I say I, I don't judge, I have no judgment, it only means my IQ is zero and I'm a zombie, which is not possible. <laughs> so judgment is a necessary evil. So in order, but you got to shape the judgment in your favor by maximizing your perception, which is, and that you can do is a front, beat your own drums, first 50 seconds, don't even present, just talk about yourself, your co-founder, uh, your team, how great you are. You know, if you say that top four or five things which make you unique, you can even say in my last company, I exited or I was VP here or I have a PhD, whatever it is. First 30, 40 seconds, you got to make the glass half full rather than half empty so that people look at you with more, you know, with more attention. So on that note, these are the seven mindset hacks for innovation and funding. And I hand over the floor to Axel. Thank you so much, Casey. Very insightful and totally uh, in agreement with what's being said there. And it's a good segue for the lessons and I since I did it once I have rethought what I'm saying today and I think my lesson number one for corporate companies is do not start a startup company within your corporation without completely isolating it from the corporate mindset number one failure of corporate mindset you have too much money so in my case example they had 21 patents, $25 million investment into an R&D only to ultimately understand that it didn't fit their company culture. It didn't fit their customer profiles. It didn't fit their sales channels. So they developed something that didn't fit into their entire corporate structure. But you had spent 25 million, so what's the only consequence you have? The only consequence is that you need to spin it out and make it its own entity 
to actually somehow capitalize it. And what you get, we heard this early on in our presentation from Boss uh, Capital Partners, if the valuation is wrong, then you can't go anywhere. So where do you go on a corporate balance sheet with a $25 million investment and zero customer traction? What do you think is your pre-money valuation? And that was the first tooth that I had to pull out of this corporate to say, yeah, the best I can probably get for you is between six and nine million pre-money. Yeah, it is good that we have 21 patents for six to nine million, but it wouldn't be good to make an uplift on 25 million to go to 30 million. So that was one very important thing. The second thing that any startup company can learn from this key example is when you go out to the investors, you have to have all your ducats in the row. That means also you have to have an investor presentation that um, covers all the necessary um, importance, such as what will be your going to market strategy. Ideally, you have customer traction. Early customer validation is so highly important. And what's your market? And when we dissect the market, which part of the market and why can you address first? Yeah, so it doesn't help when we actually put so much, I call it sent into the eyes of the investor to say, oh, our total addressable market is $6.5 trillion. You will never get to $6.5 trillion if you cannot show me how you get your first customer and why. It's so important to understand why did you get actually your first customer? Because that's where you build your strategy to actually go out. So my first part was to actually spend time to learn what they did and translate this into a presentation that was digestible to the customer. At the same stage, I tried to understand the management team and I understand, try to understand the financial requirements because as I said, you come with the wrong valuation expectations. I cannot raise your funding from the uh, venture capital community. At the time, I also said, you need to have all your ducks in the row, which means you are not spin out yet. You need to spin out. Oh, no, no. That happens quickly once we have an interested investor. Okay. Then I said, your management team is not tuned up to be presentable to the investor. We need to add two other positions out of the U.S. market. Uh, maybe that happens at a later stage. All those two points were initially not extremely well followed up. Three months in, we learned that precisely the management team was considered weak and we needed to add the, uh, to the positions. And then we finally got the traction in the venture community, a dream for every entrepreneur, right? There is an investor that is almost close to write a term sheet. Guess what happens when you want to have a term sheet? You want to have a data room. You want to make sure that what the vehicle is you're going to invest in, which was the spun out corporation and not the intention to spin out. So when once it was clear that we can get a term sheet, that is of the right conditions that we envisioned, the CEO had to go to the headquarter and negotiate the spin out. That didn't take as understood one week. It didn't take two weeks. It took three months. What can you guess what happens? The investors disappeared. Because the investor that is hot today, their focus is changing and they may not be hot tomorrow anymore or a month from now. You have to be able to seize the moment. So the company ultimately got through Pitch Global the right connection, they got um, new people, they got ultimately also investment, but it was hurting my heart that I lost the traction with one of the prime investors because it wasn't followed through with what we wanted it to, uh, to look like at a given point. So whether you are a small startup company, whether you are a big corporate spin out, the rules are identical. It doesn't make it any easier for you if you are a spin-out from IBM 
because at that point in time, you will be still, the spin-out is being treated as any other startup company. And if you don't follow the rules, that is one of the most important lessons. And everything we touched upon today, from valuation, from the right team, from the right going to market strategy, everything we learned in the early on is so true for my use case as well. So I encourage that people that come to Pitch Global come, come in and take a look as how we actually talk with companies, what advice we give, because we are looking at about 300 companies a year. I personally mentor about 30 to 40 companies a year. And what is so important, what actually um, Casey just said, that you need to be able to um, go cross-disciplinary. Um, I have spent my time in many different verticals, life sciences, cybersecurity, um, computing, and other product ranges, uh, creating semiconductor, that that actually brings a new mindset, dot connector. I consider myself a dot connector. I will never be able, although I could, if I really spend a lot of time, I will never be able to develop a single biologics. But I can tell you where you can position it and what the risk factors are, despite that I can go and build underneath and connect a few proteins together to build, to build something. And those are very special capabilities that need to be listened to so that we can help um, to make you the next big thing. And that's my dream for the rest of my life to help entrepreneurs to create the wealth they envision and the world-changing impact that the world needs to get to the next stage. With that said, I wanted to keep it brief and not too long today. We had wonderful examples of entrepreneurs pitching. We had a great presentation from our um, co-sponsor of Boss Capital. We um, had our great presentation also sponsor of Maxwell Biotech, uh, Maxwell Bioscience. The reason why I always get this wrong, because I was the uh, core advisor to a venture fund called Maxwell Biotech. And you get me every single time on that. <laughs> so um, Casey, it's always a pleasure. Um, not only uh, being together with you uh, in the business world, but you are a great friend, also a philosopher. Um, so you always give me the attitude, but it's <laughs> vice versa too as well, especially as you demonstrated with your seven mindsets for the hack. And we, I think we put a wonderful program together as a first in a series of at least seven. Yes. Um, and um, we are all about entrepreneurship. And... The final word, those who would like to pitch, we have a great event on January 5th. We took up the major effort from on the side of Pitch Global, and it wasn't actually cheap to go into um, C parallel to CES on a six to nine program on January 5th. And any company that wants to pitch there, please um, go to our event pride page and buy yourself a ticket. It's a wonderful opportunity with great investors and mentors being there. Casey, final word is yours. Yeah, thank you, Axel. You've given the final word, but I'll still say, everyone, please mark your calendar for 7th morning, 7th January, because we are going to have a second episode on seven steps for from innovation to funding. So today, we it was a mindset episode. Second one would be business planning and strategy episode co-hosted by Boss Capital Partners. So it will be a curriculum. If you just do this every once a month, it will position you and it will make you part of a very uh, nurturing and supporting community. So please mark your calendar if you can. And we will email all of you as well for 7th uh, morning. Any final word? Jillian, if you are there, why don't you give a final word? Sounds great. This was wonderful. Um, I'm happy to be here and kick off the first of the seven, possibly more events. Um, 
I think the only thing I would say is if anyone wants to sign up, I put all the details in the chat. Um, if you have questions, you can reach out to me, but I'd love to pull some optics, what's working, what's not based on the courses, and we can use that to dovetail into the next section. Um, and Randall will be presenting again on January 7th. So we're really excited to see you and thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. I declare the event closed. <laughs> have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Everyone, take care. Thanks, Thank Casey. You. Welcome, Mira.